All right, folks, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Mandy Eskelson. I'm a research associate at Mound Studies Institute, and I help, I'm one of many who help coordinate the Upper San Juan Watershed Enhancement Partnership, also sometimes called the WEP or the WEP, and they're the ones hosting this public meeting tonight. So thank you so much for joining. Um, just so you're aware, this uh, meeting is being recorded and it's going to be available on the group's website later on. And we encourage you to ask questions in the chat box whenever you like. Um, we're going to be monitoring that throughout the meeting and we'll address those uh, during the Q&A sections or when presenters invite questions from the audience. Until then, we ask you to please remain muted to reduce the background noise. So I'm just going to very quickly, before you hear from our presenters tonight, I'm going to quickly go over a few logistic items. First, the meeting layout, then a brief overview of the web and its three-phase process, and then outline some questions for us to keep in mind while you're listening to these presenters, because not only is this meeting meant to provide an update of the web's progress, but also an invitation to have your voice heard to share your feedback and ideas. So first and foremost, thank you so much to our funders from phase two, coming from the state, regional, and local partners who make this work possible. So some of you may be asking, what is the Watershed Enhancement Partnership? This is a local watershed group that formed in 2018 to start a voluntary, locally driven process to assess the diverse water uses and needs within the San Juan River Basin and to explore opportunities to address those needs. So there's options for all stakeholders to participate throughout this planning process via public meetings, joining steering committee meeting, survey responses, site visits, et cetera. Um, this is all under the guidance of the local steering committee that you see here. And you can see the two members that are highlighted in green that you're gonna hear from tonight. And so this is a small group, small committee um, that's, uh, you know, we're making it sure that it's balanced representation of different water uses and groups um, that are considered in this planning process. And so what does this group do? There's, there's a lot of terminology and jargon and players that can be associated with these processes, but tonight I really wanna try and keep it simple. And so just to give you a little context, the, some of you may be aware that the Colorado Water Plan, the different basin roundtables are updating their basin implementation plans that came out several years ago, those were being updated this year. So this effort really hopes to not only address the knowledge gaps and project needs that those plans have already identified, particularly this knowledge gap um, for environmental and recreation water needs, but it also aims to be proactive. And as these areas and projects are being prioritized across the state, we wanna make sure that this basin has current and relevant data to help local communities decide what they need to address for their water needs now and in the future. And so hoping to take this grassroots process that eventually feeds into these larger plans and makes on the ground improvements that much more likely to receive funding. And so how that looks specifically in the San Juan River Basin, we've taken a three phase approach. So phase one has focused mainly on gathering stakeholder groups and establishing a steering committee to guide that process. And then phase two, what we're currently in, that's been focusing on analyzing current and future conditions with assessments and models of different water uses and needs. And then in the third phase, um, coming up here soon in the, the summer, we're hoping to really dig in and identify and prioritize those actions into a plan with prioritized projects to benefit multiple water users. Um, and so tonight's goals, you know, it's not only to give you an update of what the web has been up to in 2020, but also to check in with you to share what our project partners, Loaded Hydrological and San Juan Conservation District, what their assessments and models are showing, as well as outline these remaining steps for phase two and what we hope to do in phase three. And so while, so we want you to keep two main things in mind tonight when you're hearing from presenters. One, do these results that we're sharing reflect what you are experiencing on the ground and what you expect to see in the future? And two, we want to hear your ideas, and this is a lot of information, how do we turn this information into actions and projects? And so keep these in mind as you're processing information from our presenters because your feedback is valuable and utilized. So for example, at one of our previous meetings, um, 
Stakeholders expressed a desire to have an analysis of how forest health and wildfire risk may affect water resources in this basin. And that became a unique component of phase two analysis that we'll be sharing tonight. Um, so that's enough for me. Let's hear from your local representatives um, from the web steering committee for the first half of the meeting. You're gonna hear from Joe Crabb of Division of Water Resources and Justin Ramsey from the Pocosa Area of Water and Sanitation District. And so they're gonna be sharing about the systems and preparations that are already in place for us to consider as we collectively start to think of how we turn these assessments and model information into project ideas. And then in the second half, you're gonna hear from experts in our project partners, Seth Mason and Cynthia Purcell, and they're gonna discuss what those assessments and models are telling us so far about current and future conditions on the San Juan, Navajo, and Blanco rivers. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Joe Crabb. Let's see. Good evening. Can you guys all hear me okay? I'll assume so. I kind of have a problem of yelling at my computer during these meetings, but it's no different than yelling at my computer without a meeting. So. I am Joe Crabb. I'm with the Colorado Division of Water Resources and for Division 7. I'm a water commissioner here in the Pagosa Springs office that oversees districts 29, 77, and 78. Um, those numbers might not make a whole lot of sense now, but we'll get further into that. I just want to provide just kind of a bird's eye view of some of the administrative issues that we deal with as the Colorado Division of Water Resources here. To have a firm understanding of this, you know, we need to have just a brief history of the Colorado Division of Water Resources. Let's see. So to begin, under the state of Colorado, we have the Department of Natural Resources. Under that umbrella is agencies like State Parks and Wildlife, the Division of Reclamation, Mining Safety, Division of Forestry, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the State Land Board, the Colorado Geologic Survey, the Colorado Water Conservation Board, the CWCB, and also the Interstate Compact Committee, and finally, the Division of Water Resources. The Division of Water Resources is historically also known as the State Engineer's Office. And Mr. Kevin Rain is also known as the State Engineer. He is the Director of the Division of Water Resources. He's got roles that span over 125 years of water administration responsibilities, public safety, we do groundwater permitting, interstate compacts, we have a hydrographic program and we do provide public information services such as this. To begin kind of with the history of the office of the state engineer, um, the, the prior appropriations doctrine was first applied to miners in 1859, so when Colorado was still a territory. I'll get more into the prior appropriations doctrine, but in a nutshell, it's basically first in right, first in time. It's the premise for the priority system. The Colorado Constitution applied the prior appropriation doctrine to all water users in 1876 with the development of the Colorado Constitution. Later, water districts and the role of the water commissioner was established by legislature in 1879, followed by the state hydraulic engineer, the state engineer that was established in 1881. And then later in 1887, our division engineers roles being established with division offices. For water administration, the Colorado Doctrine is established. All surface and groundwater in Colorado is a public resource. Um, it can be used for beneficial purposes by public agencies, private persons, and entities. And to understand a water right is a right to use a portion of this public's water resource. There's no ownership within the actual water and water molecules themselves. It's a right to use. Water right owners, they can build facilities on the lands of others. They can use it to divert, extract, or move water from a stream or aquifer to its point of use. Another unique principle is water right owners can use streams and aquifers for transportation and storage of water. As I'd mentioned, the prior appropriations doctrine. So basically those that are decreed and put the water to use first are entitled to get their water first during periods of water sh shortages. You know, the big thing here is also to recognize decreed. 
these water rights go through a water court process to get formally recognized by the state as a water right. So now in Colorado, water is a separate property right that can be bought, sold, and separated from the land. This is kind of opposed to the riparian doctrine, which is more recognized on eastern parts of the U.S., that water rights are attached to the lands that are adjacent to rivers and streams. So water administration, priority of a water right, it's the premise of how we administer water right laws. In Colorado, the priority of a water right is determined by both two components. The date water was first put to beneficial use, which is known as the appropriation date, and also when the water right was decreed by the court, that's called the adjudication, adjudication date. Now the actual seniority of a water is easily determined by looking at what's called the administrative number. And this is a number that's assigned by the Division of Water Resources. It is a sequential system that combines the adjudication date and the appropriation date. That way there is flow towards the seniority and how to administer first and right, first in time. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, there are water divisions and water districts within the state. These water divisions were established with primary drainages. So you can kind of see from the map, you got the South Platte, the Arkansas, the Gunnison, the Yampa and White, the Colorado and the Rio Grande and where we're at the San Juan and Dolores. Again, we do have state offices in all seven of those divisions. And we also have certain field offices in locations like Pagosa Springs here. So there are seven water divisions in 80 water districts. And we are located in the San Juan, Animas and Dolores division. And we have a division office in Durango, uh, division seven. More locally, this is a map of the Division 7 water districts. Again, it spans all the way to the Four Corners region past Cortez, and we're kind of on the eastern end here in Pagosa Springs. We oversee districts 78, 29, and 77. Uh, with it, water districts, they go beyond county boundaries. So for instance, District 78, it represents the Piedra drainage. It overlaps in between Hinsdale County and Archuleta County. Uh, District 29 is the main stem of the San Juan River that also spans into Mineral County and Archuleta County. And then way down in the corner there is District 77, which oversees the Navajo River drainage. Again, our Pagosa Springs field office, we have three water commissioners here that oversee those drainages. Um, we have pretty limited hours, especially during the summer months, because we do spend a lot of time monitoring, documenting, and just making observations of diversions and seeing how people are using water and putting it to beneficial use. And again, all this contact information we can provide at the end. You can Google us up. We're pretty easy to find, and we're out in the field a lot. So as I said, the water commissioner position was formally established in 1879, so it's a very old position within the state of Colorado. Um, from a statistics standpoint, water commissioners in the state engineer's office and division engineers, we manage over 173,000 water rights, and those are growing annually. There's over 105,000 different structures, whether they're storage structures, diversion structures, our offices have made over 390 observations of these structures and documented. Um, with that, we publish diversion and storage records. We maintain over 30,000 of those records. Um, our offices have assisted on over 1,200 water court consultations to establish water right decrees. At any given time, statewide, there could be up to 50 water court cases in, in litigation. We also assist with subdivision referrals and water supply plans to provide comment towards subdivisions and also uh, substitute water supply plans and replacement plans. And I'll get to a little bit more of what those specifically are as we move towards administration. So as I said, water right administration is primarily a role when streams go short and decreed water right users based on their priority within the priority system can place calls for water. At that point, the Division of Water Resources administers stream priority diversions, first in right, first in time. 
For some of these situations to occur, a priority surface diversion and water ride holder, they have to have a head gate structure, some form of a control device. These devices also need to have a mechanism that we can lock it if needed. If we set a flow being diverted from it, we have to have reassurance that that flow is not gonna change based on the adjustment of a head gate. Another unique property is diverting structures who are wanting to place calls, they have to have a valid measuring device. We need to have some sort of reassurance that the quantity of water being diverted is within their priority system and their water right decree. And then finally, the big one is priority diversions can only be used per the decreed priority uses. And so as we are administering streams and uh, structures in place there, we need to be aware of how the water is being used. We need to know how much of that water is being used and where it's being used are all essential components. There are certain streams that could have multiple priorities that are available and in priority towards the stream. And so we have to be able to balance the water. We have to ration the water and provide other priorities if they're in sequential order, basically, they're available water. So to, to begin, you know, a, a big notion is overappropriated streams. Water calls typically occur on streams that are water critical areas. Water critical areas are over appropriated in the sense that there are more adjudicated water rights than there is available water sources. And so during these times of shortage, that's when water users call for their water. This also entails we curtail and we shut down out of priority water rights to meet the needs of senior water rights. This could be shutting down multiple structures to get water to a multiple group of other structures that are in priority. And certain times within administration, we implement augmentation plans. An augmentation plan is a court approved plan to replace out of priority diversions. So you have certain structures that may be junior in the prior appropriations system, but they've created engineered court approved plans to replace their out of priority diversions. This sometimes entails making reservoir releases. We can also just verify agricultural dry ups that the water that was historically used for an agricultural purpose is no longer being used and they've changed that use. We also will oversee what I had mentioned earlier, substitute water supply plans. Now these are generally one year plans that the state engineer's office can approve to replace out of priority diversions. And they're more common with gravel pit operations that have um, impacts from evaporative loss. But there's, there's many types of different um, substitute water supply plans that can be reviewed and implemented. This is a map of the division seven water critical boundaries. Those areas highlighted in pink, they are defined by the division seven as being water critical. There's areas where calls have historically taken place. We anticipate, you know, there'd be a water short system and have to administer the priority system. Um, again, we're fortunate at the current time that the main stem of the Piedra River, the main stem of the San Juan, and the main stem of the Navajo River are not water critical areas. Um, water critical areas also impact wells, um, homeowners ability to get wells based on subdivision approvals, so there's a lot of intricacies about it. If you move further west towards the Dolores areas like Cortez, the Mancus, the La Plata, all of basically the Florida and the Pine, these are all water critical areas where there is constant um, water administration that is needed to meet the needs of the priority system. Again, as I said, our water critical streams that we have in this area where we know there is priority um, administration that's needed because they're typically water short streams or in the fact that they're over adjudicated, um, Four Mile Creek is one. We have Coal Creek, uh, the Little Blanco Creek, the Oil Well Creek, Little Navajo Creek, East Fork of the Piedra, Devil Creek on the Piedra tributary, and also along Stolsteimer Creek. And so again, having a water critical designation impacts abilities for our office to issue well permits, um, 
abilities for people to establish new water rights, there could be a lot more involved to establish that priority and beneficial use. To, to move on, there's kind of that opposite spectrum of in-stream priorities and state administration of stream. Um, the Supreme Court, the Colorado Supreme Court, has basically said that there's times when sufficient natural supply to satisfy all water users, whether they're decreed or undecreed, and the state engineer administration is unnecessary for the protection of decreed water rights. So in a sense, there's times of the year when there is enough water available, particularly in our main stem of the San Juan and the Piedra, that property owners and water right users can divert water without having a decreed water right. Again, for this to occur during, for diversions during free river conditions, you know, we, we request and try and get out there and know that they're going on. And so, you know, to have that communication with our office that free river conditions exist. Um, we also like to look at those to make sure when the situations change that, you know, it's no longer free water available, that those types of diversions can be shut down in a safe manner without negatively impacting other adjudicated water rights. And finally, it's just the big one there. Is there a beneficial use to diverting water? Um, there's a lot of subjective issues towards that um, on what beneficial use is. We have defined statutory rules on what's beneficial use, but you know, a homeowner's beneficial use to one neighbor might not be interpreted as the same beneficial use to the next neighbor. Um, free river diversions can change. There's limitations to it. You know, the biggest one is that the conditions no longer exist. You have spring runoff, there's plenty of water available. And as that water slowly diminishes, we may put that stream stretch under administration and we have to pull. And that's the first thing that gets curtailed and stops diverting our non-decreed structures. So we need to know where those are at. We spend a lot of time out in the field identifying those to be prepared for when those situations change. There's also potential diversion and storage accounting limitations. There's volumetric limits towards those specific water rights that must be maintained, maintained to prevent injury by altering some of the historic timing that those water rights were used. If you're using a free river condition now, but then you're claiming a call scenario based on your historically used water right, that has potential for injury to other downstream users. And the last one is waste of diverted water. Waste is a very difficult situation within our office. Uh, there's always that, that notion of, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Within water rights, one person's wasted water could be another person's adjudicated decreed water right. There's decrees out there that are solely established on tailwaters of irrigation practices. Um, there are statutes to try and help guide that. And it's during the, the summer seasons, people should not run through their irrigation ditches any greater quantity that's needed to absolutely necessary, what is needed to irrigate what's needed for domestic. And again, the, the whole thing is, is to prevent a useless discharge and running away of water that might have a greater benefit remaining in the stream. Um, there's also the Colorado Revised Statute 3796-102C. Um, it's the policy of the state to promote the conservation and efficient use of water and to prevent you know, the loss of this valuable resort, resource. Um, it boils down when the amount of water diverted is not necessary for its conveyance and application to beneficial use, the result can be wasting of water. And our office can get involved. There are um, some limitations towards it, but again, a lot of that is subjective to those water users, their specific systems that are in place. There's been a lot of issues along the White River and the Yampa River in Division 6, way up north, on further defining some of these impacts of waste. Um, again, there's private and public benefits to not wasting water as you know, you can, everybody could imagine, but from an irrigation standpoint, from a water using standpoint, recreational standpoint, and everything that, you know, the watershed enhancement group is looking at is basically diverting more water than is necessary for beneficial use can deplete natural steam fl stream flows. There's a multitude of users along these stretchers who all have their own 
personal use, there could be an economic use towards it, um, a, a whole lot of benefit to keep water in streams if it does not have a beneficial use. Um, there's also just the fact that applying more water than necessary to wet the root zone, this can result in undesirable leaching of nutrients into the stream system and further provide, you know, contaminants that would naturally be there. Also, there are certain crops that can experience a reduced yield when water is applied in excess to what the full irrigation requirement. We see lots of call it sloth grass or wire grass that, you know, even stock and cattle won't eat that grass because it's just so over irrigated. So there, there's a lot of natural benefits to not wasting water within the state of Colorado and particularly in our Pagosa area and streams. And our office tries to work with water users to understand those effects. Again, so the Division of Water Resources, we are the state of Colorado, Colorado's agency that oversees water administration. This is everything from groundwater and water well permitting. Um, people who want to build ponds, lakes, reservoirs, dams, any structure that is used to impound water, our office is generally involved. We do have a dam safety branch. We have hydrographers, stream and diversion measurements. Um, we do public outreach, like I said, and we also have interstate water compact agreements and the compliance that our offices all assist with. And so kind of to wrap it up, you know, a structure that really ties a lot of things in together. This is known as the Oso diversion. This is one of the San Juan Chama diversion structures that basically conveys water from the San Juan River into New Mexico. This particular one is off the Navajo River. It's very big water this year. I believe when we measured it, that was about 1400 CFS coming over the OG, which is the dam face. Now these types of structures, this falls within a category of a free river condition diversion. They, they're entitled to take that water. It also falls within compact compliance. The water that they divert and take and use from these structures go towards compact compliance and sharing this resource that originates in Colorado to the multitude of states that also need it. You know, there's 19 states who have some sort of call and relationship to the water systems in Colorado. Um, finally, this is also known as a transbasin diversion. It doesn't cross over the continental divide in Colorado, but once you break over into New Mexico, it crosses the divide over there. And like I said, it's documented and classified as a out of state um, export of water. So again, very, very unique situation that we do have in the Pagosa Springs area. Again, I'm uh, the, the commissioner here in the Pagosa Springs office. We also have Alan Schutz and Bob Formwalt who have their respective districts and a wealth of knowledge. Uh, water administration is specific to the streams, specific to the water users, and specific to the structures and water rights that are established out there. Um, again, we're, we're always open. We're here for questions to, to try and help mitigate any sort of negative interactions between water users and ultimately to use this scarce resource most efficiently. So. Again, that's my contact information. Um, if you guys have further questions in the future, please reach out to us. We're, we're here to help in whatever way we can. Thanks so much, Joe. That was great. Um, we're gonna transition to having Justin Ramsey present, but don't worry, we're gonna have a Q&A session um, in between before um, Seth and Cynthia present. And feel free to enter any questions you may have right now. If you're like me and don't want to forget them, feel free to put those in the chat. We'll make sure those are addressed here in just a moment. Uh, Justin, go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, let me un let me unmute first. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is our 2020 draft um, drought management plan uh, that our board just approved actually a couple of weeks ago on March 11th. Um, so I got here in, in 2015 and at that time we had a drought management plan that was either written or, or revised in 2012. Um, I revised it in 2018 and I didn't 
the revision was pretty minor. I, I, I re, redid some numbers, but we kind of kept it the same as it, as, it, as it had always been. And it was really based on um, putting us in drought stages based on um, commu our cumulative water sources, um, how much water is in the river, how much water is in our reservoirs, so on and so forth. Um, and this was written the winter of 2017, 2018. And then as you may recall, in the spring, summer, and fall of 2018, we went into drought. And due to that drought, we realized there were some um, inherent weaknesses with our drought management plan. So we decided we needed to, to redo that. And um, what we have now, this 2020 drought management plan is, is from that. And I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do right now today is kind of talk about where our water comes from and how we get it to the various um, um, clients of our district. So that's wrong. And I think when I get into that, you'll kind of understand why that cumulative water source way of getting this into the drought stages uh, didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then I'll talk about what we did to address that and what, what changes we made in our 2020 drought management plan, which I think will, will end up being a much better plan than what we had previously. Um, so our district, uh, the, the Pagosa Area Water and Sanitation District covers about 70 square miles. We only have about 6,000 connections, just a touch over 6,000 connections. The state um, deems us a medium water provider. Um, and it's because that's based on how many, what our population is. But if you look at our area at 70 square miles, we're actually a fairly large geographical, geographic uh, water provider, but we, we don't have a whole lot of connections. Um, in that 70 square miles, we have about 300 miles of water line in the ground that divert, that bring our treated water throughout the community. Um, the district's broken into two parts, what we call the Pagosa Lakes area, District 1, and the downtown or District 2 area. And the reason that is, is in, in the early 70s, when the Pagosa Area Water Sanitation District was formed, it was formed by developers that were doing the development in the Pagosa Lakes area, in the uptown area. And that's all we covered was that uh, uptown area. In 1992, Paws took over the town's water system because the town used to have their own water system. And at the same time, we also took over a water system known as Archletta Water. Archletta Water was a water system, a private water system that provided water to individuals around Pagosa, but not quite within the district, that down Highway 84 and kind of in that buffer area between downtown proper and, and in Uptown Pagosa. Um, so we took that over 92. This map here shows us that our entire district. Um, the pink area and blue area is where we provide water. The pink area is just what we, where we treat wastewater. So what is our water system? We have um, three river, so all of our water is surface water that comes from either the, the San Juan or tributaries of the San Juan. We have three river diversions, uh, seven separate reservoirs, three water treatment plants, the Snowball Plant, Hatcher, and San Juan. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those here shortly. And as I said, we have that 300 miles of water line. Um, we also have three fill stations. So we have one at the, at the um, fairgrounds, one at our main office at, on Lynn Avenue and one um, uh, on west of, west of, west of town. Um, and th what that allows is people that are not in the district that but do need water, they can go to these fill stations and buy water in these fill stations. Um, we also have one wastewater treatment plant um, and we have about 60 miles of, of sewer lines. I hope you can see this map because this is, this is probably the most useful map that I'm gonna be talking about today. This shows where our diversions are and where we divert water to and where it goes. So if you look at the top right-hand corner, that's our West Fork Diversion. And that's located right off um, Highway um, 160. And we divert water right out of the West Fork. It goes into a pipeline and, it, and the gravity feeds for about six miles to um, what the state refers to as Lake Pagosa. It's a 14 acre foot pond that we then pull water out in our snowball plant to, to treat water. And so it's all gravity. Matter of fact, as, as you drive down the highway on the, on the um, 
west side of the highway, you can kind of see some of our pipes. I mean, the pipes above ground, it's that black HTPE pipe above ground. That's, that's actually our water line that, that sends water down there for our treatment plant. At the very top is our Four Mile Creek diversion, and that diverts water from Four Mile Creek, and it goes into what we call the Dutton Pipeline. The Dunn pipeline runs for about seven miles, um, gravity all the way to Hatcher Reservoir. Um, the Hatcher Reservoir is where our Hatcher water treatment plant is, and we pull water out of the Hatcher, out of the, out of the Hatcher Reservoir to treat to, to send to the community. Um, we have the ability in the Dutton pipeline to um, open a valve and take water out of the Dutton pipeline and put it into the Dutton ditch, which can then also feed Stevens Reservoir. Um, Stevens Reservoir, we don't have a water treatment plant on Stevens Reservoir, but what we can do with that water is divert it down um, a pipeline into uh, Lake Pagosa. Lake Pagosa also does not have a water treatment plant, but we could take water from that, from Lake Pagosa and divert it into uh, Village Lake, and from Village Lake, we can divert it into Lake Forest. We do have the ability to treat water out of Lake Forest. Um, on Village Lake, um, the golf course and several of, um, communities, uh, uh, condominium communities, do pull water directly out of Village and they use it for uh, raw water irrigation. Um, the golf course also has a pump station on Village that'll, that'll pump water to Pinion Lake. And Pinion Lake's a small lake right in front of Walmart. And again, the golf course and some of the condominium communities use that water um, for irrigation purposes. Our third diversion is on the very bottom center of the screen, and that's on the main stem of the San Juan. It's about three miles south of town. And that water is diverted, but then it's pumped. We have to use it. We have a series of pump stations that pump that water up, and it can be pumped into Village Lake, it can be pumped into Lake Forest, or it can be pumped directly into our San Juan water treatment plant. So here's what our diversions can do. So our West Fork, we are we can divert five CFS. That's what our water right is on the on the West Fork. And again, that feeds snowball. On the main stem of the Colorado, we have a water right of 17.4 CFS. And on four mile, we have a, a, a water right of 13.7. Now it seems really good, and that's quite a bit of water. However, it's it's not quite as uh, rosy as it sounds. So the West Fork water right was at five CFS. It's all that's absolute. It was it was it was pre 1922 compact. It's really a, a good strong water right. The main stem out of that 17.4 CFS, only one and a half of, of that is is absolute. Um, so we haven't perfected all that water right yet. We're working on on doing that as as, as we go. The four mile now, although it's it is an absolute water right, um, as Joe was saying, the, the prior appropriations doctrine kind of gets us because there was 11 people in front of us that had prior appropriations. So about every June, we lose that water right um, because the, uh, the uh, four mile goes into uh, administration and then we don't get it back till October-ish. So um, we, we do lose that right uh, over the summertime, which is when we need to water the most. We also have a bunch of ditch rights and I'm really, um, uh, simplifying our water rights. Our water rights resume is, is fairly com um, comprehensive, so I'm, I'm kind of simplifying it. But we have a bunch of ditches that we have water rights to as well. Um, you can see from J.B. Martinez all the way down to Fawn Gulch. These are water rights that PAWS has, has collected over the years, and they drain into the, the various reservoirs or, or to our diversions that we can, that we can pull out. So here's our reservoirs. Um, Hatcher, um, I have the spillway volume. So that's the volume that can, when that, when that reservoir is totally full versus usable. I really only care about the usable. So what that means is the straw that we're using to pull water out of those reservoirs isn't at the very bottom of the bowl. It's a little ways up. So when you look at Hatcher, we have about 880 acre feet of usable volume. Stevens is by far has our, the most usable volume. Um, and then it, it goes down with Lake Pagosa Village and Lake Forest. Uh, Pinion Lake um, or Reservoir, like I said, we really don't use that water. We, it is our water and we do sell it to the guys who irrigate it, but it's, we, we have no way to get that. Once it gets in the Pinion, we have no way to get that out and get into our distribution system. 
Martinez and Dry Gulch are reservoirs which we have water rights to, but have not been constructed and they're not, um, there's no plans to construct them at this time. So I'll talk about our treatment plants a little bit. Um, our snowball plant, um, which is a, was the water plant that we received from the town in 1992 and we took over their system. Uh, that plant can put out um, 2 million gallons a day. And again, it receives its water from the West Fork of the San Juan. The Hatcher plant, which gets its water from Four Mile, is another two, uh, 2 million gallon a day plant. And the San Juan plant is a little more complicated. As you may remember, I said that we can send water directly to that plant from the river, or we can divert water from Lake Forest. Lake Forest, Lake Forest and Village Lake and, and Pagosa Lake really are fairly shallow lakes and they were, really, they were designed for aesthetics. They really weren't designed for water systems. So there's a lot of organics, a lot of discoloration, um, a lot of taste and odor problems with the water that comes from Lake Forest when we try to treat that. So we have to do a lot more treating of that water to make it potable to, to be used. Thus, we can't, we, we lose some of our ability to treat water out of that plant. So we, if we treat water out of the Lake Forest, we can really only get about one, million, one MGD, one million gallons per day. Um, it's also extremely expensive if we try to treat it out of there because we have to use so much um, pre-treatment to get that water to a, a, a usable level. If we pump it directly from the lake the, or the river, the river water is much cleaner. We're very fortunate in Pagosa that um, we're at the very top of the watershed. There's not a, there's, there's really no mining to speak of. Uh, there's no industry. So our water coming out of the rivers are, are, is, is pretty good. So if we pull water directly out of the river, we can get three MGD, three million gallons a day out of that San Juan plant. Here was our water productions in, in 2020, so last year. And so you can see we did about 2.2 million acre feet, and that's both potable water that was that was sent into our distribution system, and then that raw water that we, like I said, we sold out of Village or Pinion Lake. And if you look at that graph down towards the bottom right there, you can really see that we um, produce and sell a lot more water during the summer months than the winter months. And the reason for that is twofold. One is the population in Pagosa does tend to uh, swell a little bit in the summertime, um, but probably more primarily the reason for that is irrigation. Um, irrigation use goes up and so we sell substantial uh, more water and that becomes very important. We'll talk about that when I get into the uh, drought management plan. So the drought management plan. The 2012-2018 drought management plan, um, basically we, we, they built a, a, a series of drought stages of, of you know, how bad the drought was and what we had to do to try to circumvent that drought. Um, and so to get into those drought stages, they set up trigger points. And as I said, the original trigger point was based on the community amount of water, basically how much water is in all the reservoirs, plus how much water was flowing down the San Juan River. Um, it also has, if, when you go to those different drought stages, there's things you can't do. You can't water, you, you can only water on certain days or you can't water. Um, and so we had non-compliance, what you do if, if somebody just says, doesn't abide by that um, drought management plan. And then there's also drought surcharges and water rate adjustments. Um, the drought management plan is set up to reduce everybody's water use to, to, to save water. The problem with that is the way PAWS um, receives money is by selling water. So if we start selling less water, um, we don't have the same amount of income coming in. And there's some argument that we're not producing as much, it's not costing as much, but a lot of our fees are the same. We have to, all of our lab fees and, and all the things we have to do with the state to verify that the water is safe, costs the same whether we sell one gallon of water or, or 10 million gallons of water. So there's a lot of, in our, our most of our, you know, we still have to have people at the plants, so our labor fees stay the same. So no matter what we're doing with water sales, our, our costs stay up. So the drought surcharges and water rate adjustments are were put in place to try to make sure that we can still uh, maintain our budget during times when we're trying to get people to quit buying our product. 
So here's kind of what we're trying to do um, when we go into these different stages and what we're looking at with those trigger points. Again, this is the pre-2020, this is our original um, drought management. We are looking at when the, when the amount of water that we have available to us, which was in all the, all the reservoirs and the river drops below 90, uh, we would put ourselves into a voluntary stage. And with that, we're trying to save about 10% of our water cells. We're trying to reduce water production by 10%. And then you go through level one all the way through level four. So you can see as the water level that we, as, as the water that we have available to us um, drops, uh, we're trying to save more and more water by implementing um, stronger and stronger rules of what you can do with your water. And so that's the way it was always done. Like I said, this was done in 2018. And then as you may recall, um, we wrote the tooth, we, we revised the 2018 drought management plan in the winter of 2017, 2018. Then in the spring, summer, and fall, we got went into a drought. And what we had determined was it doesn't really matter sometimes how much water might be in the river. If if Hatcher Reservoir is running out of water, I can't get water from the river to um, Hatcher. So then it, it put us into a bad situation where we didn't even go into a, we wouldn't even gone into a level one drought stage until late October of 2018 which was really too late because we were really experiencing some, some, some drought issues prior to that. So it, fortunately, 2019 came, it was really a wet year and we survived it, but it could have, it could have been detrimental. Um, so here's what we do with these different levels. And these levels didn't even change in our 2020 drought management plan. We're kind of still doing the exact same thing. Um, so if we're in the, the voluntary method, or stage, it's just public awareness. Pro, pro, um, projects like this, and I'll get on the radio or, or write things in the newspaper trying to get people to uh, conserve water, but there's no requirement for, for water conservation. Once we get to a level one, um, irrigation is only permitted uh, in the evenings and the early mornings. We don't want you watering uh, in the heart of the day when you lose so much to evaporation. Um, and then when you get to uh, level two, uh, we Break it down to where you can only do it on odd, uh, even in odd days, only during the week. You can't water on weekends. Uh, level three means now you can only water one day a week. And level four means your grass is going to die. You can't water at all. Uh, for the surcharges and to, to make up that money with the level, once we went into a level one, we would we would have, this, again, this is the, the old um, drought management plan. You don't went into a surcharge. Um, when we hit to a level one, and then uh, at level two, level three, and level four, we'd have a rate multiplier for people that use um, the higher tiered water. It, it, you may know that we have a tiered water rate. So for your first 8,000 gallons, we charge about $4.50 per thousand, and it, it basically doubles um, from 8,000 to 20,000 to 20,000 above. Um, so those high users, you're going to see we would, we would be doubling, tripling, and, and quadrupling what they'd be paying if they're using a lot of water. And, and basically doing the same thing for commercial. It's a little different because um, the feeling has been that sometimes the commercial users don't have quite as much control. You know, if you're running a car wash, you're using water. There's only so much you can do. So they, the, the board, um, the drought management plan um, gives a little leeway with commercial. So why didn't this work? The reason it didn't work is, like I said before, um, the water in the San Juan can be at flood stage, but if I don't have any water in Lake Hatcher, um, or I can't get any water out of Four Mile, um, I don't have enough water to beat the town. That, that 3 MGD that I can get out of the San Juan plant wouldn't be enough, or vice versa. I, I need all those plants in the summertime to be operating, so I need water going to each one of those things. Um, another problem was the time of the year really plays a significant role. If, um, if Hatcher's at 80% full in October, we're in great shape. If Hatcher's 80 foot full in May, we're in deep trouble. So we really had to start looking at uh, the amount of water we had available to us during um, particular times of the year. So what we did is we put together a drought management committee and we tried to uh, make sure that that committee had had a variety of individuals, um, both uh, from the environmental community and from the business community. So we, we, we put people on there that had businesses that used a high amount of water because 
they don't want us to go into a drought stage unnecessarily um, because it could uh, affect their business. Um, but we also don't want to not go into a drought stage and end up having a, a, a going into a um, higher drought stage later. So it was kind of, it's a kind of a balance next. We put together a fairly diverse committee to help put together this new drought management plan. So what we did is we put together a variety of triggers. And again, if you look across the top, we're also going to change where those, what those triggers are based on the time of the year. So early on, what we're going to look at is the snow tail water equivalency and the call date on the on Four Mile Creek. So the, the um, NRCS has a snow tail station up on the pass that we look at. And it, one of the things it gives us, gives us lots of information. One of the things is, is what the snow water equivalency, how much water is in the snowpack up there. And um, so we're going to look at that. And when that hits zero, we're going to look at the median. If it hits zero too early, so the snow melts off early, that'll put us into a into one of the drought stages, depending on when it happens. Same with the call date on four mile. If they, if the, um, if Joe does a call early on on that, we may have to go into a drought stage because we're no longer going to get water going into Hatcher, and Hatcher is going to start to drop. As as the summer goes on, we'll probably look more at um, the Hatcher reservoir level, the San Juan River flow, and the drought stages. And what we're doing with that, we're going to look at those three together but we're gonna give the most weight to the Hatcher Reservoir level. That's the most, that's the most critical item. But we're also gonna look at the flows in the river based on historical flows during that various times of the year. And then we're also gonna look at the state drought, sta the drought stages that the state puts us in. So here's the snow tail data. And, and the red line indicates what the median um, amount of snow, of, of snow water equivalency is on the mountain at, during that particular time of the year. Um, and the blue is where we're at now, and that was last week's number. So we're about 93% of where we were. And, but you can see where that red line drops down right here. So on average, somewhere around the 1st of June is when the snow water equivalency uh, reaches zero. So if this hydrograph peak really drops early and we end up down here, we're gonna go into a drought stage, depending on where that falls on, 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 from, the, from the median date. And then this is the, the call on Four Mile Creek. So you can see that it median that typically occurs about the middle of June is when they typically have a call. But again, if it's a real dry, dry year and they put a call on it, um, you know, end of May, that could put us into a, 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 a drought stage earlier. And then here's the Hatcher Reservoir level. And all I did was I looked over, I, so the, the, the green is the lowest, I, I took the lowest, um, um, Volume of water in the in in the um, in Hatcher for the from 2014 to 2020, and then I also did the same with maximum, and you can also see the average and median. So again, we'll look where that's at. So, like I said, if we are at 80 percent um, in October, we're really in good shape for the year. But if we're at 80 percent in May, we we got real problems. So again, that can that can push us into that drought stage. Um, same thing with with San Juan River flows. The river flows differently during different parts of the year. So we'll look at that and determine what drought stage we'll be in. And then the drought monitor that the state puts together. That's where we'll look at that. And, um, and that has some, that'll have some bearing on what drought stage we'll go into and when we go into that drought stage. We did change the surcharge and tier rates where we will not charge a surcharge until we get to a level three or level four. So we kind of, we, we pushed that back. Um, hopefully that won't affect our budget too much, but we kind of, we, we broke that because I, I know based on this new, the, the reason we end up doing that is because with this new drought management, we're gonna end up in drought stages earlier and, and, and the, the board and the committee was concerned that it would look like a money grab and we don't wanna do that. We're doing, we're going in these drought stages to try to save water, not to try to pad our pockets. So that's where that's, where that's at. And that's it. Thanks so much, Justin. Well, folks, you heard a lot of information. Um, we're just slightly behind schedule, but I want to make sure there's time for folks who want to ask questions right now. You can see why we have built this steering committee that has this expertise and knowledge that kind of factors into the planning, because not all of us can keep this complex information in our head. And so that's why we really rely on Justin and Joe to kind of 
kind of feed into this planning. Any questions? Um, yeah, I have a question for, for Justin. This is Bill Hudson. Um, it, it looked like the, the chart you showed us of your production numbers, it looked like that those numbers didn't add up to your, to your total. Uh, it looked like you had a lot more in the small numbers and then the total didn't look like it, it matched. Am I, am I seeing that wrong? No, you're probably right. My math is probably wrong. Wouldn't be the okay. first time. <laughs> okay. Well, if, you, if those are slides you're gonna use for other people, you may wanna, you may wanna just look at that one slide. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll review those. Thanks, Bill. Anyone else at this time? Okay, great. I had a question. Um, this sure. is Lisa Jensen. Sorry, I'm not <laughs> visible. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have all the information. I was on another water presentation a day or two ago, and this is more of a state, um, it was something more statewide. And one thing I heard on there was um, just in passing was they were talking about um, more, more overall. So they were talking about Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And I forget one they said was at something like 40% capacity right now. And one was at 37. Um, I may have, I was multitasking. So I may not have heard that correctly, but it was rather shocking. And I didn't know if that has any impact on our water here. I mean, we don't get water from there, obviously our water goes there, but, um, or I don't know if that's, if anyone can answer anything like that or knows anything about that. Um, we might have lost Joe. Oh, I was going to ask him, but yeah. there's a couple other folks on this call who could help. Go ahead, Nellie. Yeah, and yeah, if Joe comes back in, he I'm can still here. But <laughs> oh, you're here, Joe. Do you want to take that call? You want me to? Um, you, you know, again, from a local level, not at all. There, it has to be a very large compact call, and there is the whole compact committees. Um, I think. Mile has had some experience with, you know, some of those groups as well. Um, but again, there, there would have to be an overall call on the main stem of the Colorado River to really trigger um, statewide administration. And that's where Justin had mentioned also, you know, that they have water rights that are pre-compact. Um, the pre-compact is, you know, your 1921 Colorado River um, call that separates, you know, the upper basin from the lower basin at Lee's Ferry and how much water needs to get through there. Um, again, that those levels haven't been triggered or initiated that call at this point. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Joe covered it and that's the bottom line. It's, it's a very complex um, administration system when you're talking about administering the Colorado River across states. Um, but the bottom line is that for, I think for us at a local level, um, it's a question of whether there's gonna be a compact coal and that means uh, Colorado not fulfilling its obligations to deliver the water that they're supposed to deliver uh, and that triggering um, a decision to start cutting people back to make that happen. Uh, frankly, we don't know at this point how that would be handled. <laughs> it's a question we keep asking. Um, we don't know how the state engineer will, will handle that yet. There's been discussion about at some point, uh, if we get closer to that risk to develop uh, regulations that will tell us the answer to that, but uh, uh, at this point, it's, it's not a very clear answer. But uh, bottom line is that we are affected if there is a compact call, for sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. There was a little bit of a discussion on your math in the chat box. There, are possible solutions. Thanks for pointing that out, Aaron. Yeah, I think what I did, I, I think I. I, I updated a, a presentation from 2016. I think it was 2016 numbers, and I didn't include raw water then. So I'm playing. I'm playing with it right now. That's what I think I did. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to our um, our project partner, Seth Mason from Loaded Hydrological, and then after him, we'll hear from Cynthia Purcell of San Juan Conservation District. 
Seth, I'm ready for you to share your, your screen whenever you're ready. Yeah. Okay, how do we do? Looks good. All right, uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Seth Mason, Lodic Hydrological. Uh, we've been working with, uh, well, with you all uh, for the better part of a year now to answer some specific questions, conduct some specific in investigations into uh, relationships between flows in the river and the ability of uh, our local rivers and streams to support environmental and recreational uses. Um, we did a little bit of um, extra work uh, in thinking about the, the water forest health nexus. We'll get into that a little bit later, but by and large, our work was a, a non-consumptive needs assessment um, that followed a, a specific kind of planning framework that's being used in other parts of the state. And if you were in, on the first call or the first community uh, presentation for this project, you probably saw me present this. Um, I, I like to use this figure uh, everywhere that I present on these planning efforts because it does help kind of ground the conversation um, and helps people understand where, we, where we've been and where we're going and, and why we're doing it at all. Uh, so uh, some time ago, you all worked through phase one of this effort, and phase one was really kind of assembling the stakeholder group, getting everybody talking, thinking about um, the scope of work that would then be implemented in phase two. That's the meat of what we're talking about today, which is really focused on characterizing uh, existing conditions and risks, thinking about the future, and then using that information to select uh, objectives and measurable results that will then in phase three, which is coming, Mandy mentioned, um, will then be used to identify uh, potential alternative actions and then evaluate and prioritize those and kind of tee them up for implementation in subsequent steps. Um, oh, where's all my text? There we go. So this, uh, this planning effort, or my involvement in this planning effort began in May of last year. Uh, we, we came in, we were focused specifically on the, the San Juan, Rio Blanco, and Navajo, uh, essentially each of those watersheds above the Highway 84 dividing line uh, and not below. And a majority of our focus uh, was on the, the San Juan. Uh, and then we, we did do work in the Blanco and Navajo as, as our uh, time and budget allowed. And it's important to note here that we were working uh, on this effort and there was a par this parallel effort um, that Cynthia is gonna speak about later. Uh, it was focused on the, the consumptive uh, side of water use. So we've got the, the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is really non-consumptive use focused um, environment and recreation. And then Cynthia will talk about the, the consumptive side. Uh, a lot of, there, there can be some confusion about what these planning efforts are, are supposed to do. Um, and so I, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time here just so you understand why we went to all this effort to do this investigation. Um, this type of planning is motivated by specific language that's provided uh, in the Southwest Basin Roundtables Basin Implementation Plan and some corresponding language in the Colorado Water Plan that calls for its assessments of environmental and recreational use needs. Uh, in priority streams all across the state. Uh, the recommendations that come out of this effort, hopefully be used to inform future updates to the basin implementation plan for the Southwest Basin. And that should then um, kind of elevate projects, uh, programs or processes that, that get passed on through the BIP for funding by either the round table or the state. Uh, the state recently passed Proposition DD that provides a pretty big pot of money for water projects. So th this isn't um, a frivolous effort. This is intended to, to benefit the local community pretty directly uh, by way of enhancing opportunities for funding of local projects. So that's why we're doing this. Um, when it comes to thinking specifically about phase two and the work that, that we did over the last however many months, eight months, uh, it involved a consideration of the existing data and literature that's out there, a review of that information, 
Uh, and then we really dived into the data. We did a lot of work characterizing historical, current, and future hydrology. Uh, we thought about the nexus between hydrology and various measures of ecological integrity and in riverine systems. Uh, we explored this water and forest health nexus, characterized recreational uses and the relationship between those uses on the river and flows in the river and management of the river. Uh, and then lastly, where we're going to be kind of transitioning out of this phase into the next one is in this identification of high priority management issues and locations. And that's, that's really the handoff to phase three. Okay. Um, like the side slide says, this is a water planning effort. And so we spend a lot of time in these efforts thinking about hydrology. Um, and we need to think about hydrology in historical terms and current time, uh, time frames, and also uh, in terms of uh, potential changes that might be coming. Um, if we're thinking about history, you know, recent history or the present, then we look to existing uh, stream flow gauges. And if we look across the planning area, we see that we have um, gauges in Pagosa on the San Juan and then uh, various gauges on uh, Blanco and Navajo rivers. Um, we focus specifically on the gauge in Pagosa and on the Navajo up at Banded Peak because those have uh, good long records and they are also above some of the, the large uh, downstream trans basin diversions that Joe uh, noted earlier. Um, we, we did a, a, a large kind of statistical analysis on all of the historical data uh, from, from those two locations, actually in all these locations, we're gonna talk about these two locations and use that investigation to identify significant trends in stream flow behavior. And that's an important um, characteristic of, of flow when we're, when we're doing planning and we've got our eye on the future. We kind of want to know where we've been and how things have been moving over recent history. So if we look at the time period between 1990 and 2020, we analyze the data, we see some interesting characteristic shifts in behavior. This probably aligns pretty closely with what you kind of anecdotally see or you know, might know to be true. And that is we see a, a, a general reduction over that 30 year period uh, in the July to September yield. So the, the amount of water that's coming down the river uh, to the tune of 700 acre feet a year. We see a, a shift in the timing of runoff. So a shift in the uh, timing to the beginning of runoff uh, that is about five days per, per 10 years, five days per decade a downward shift in the August and September median flows of two to three CFS per year. So those numbers might not sound like much, but if you multiply that out by 30, you get to some pretty big numbers. Um, it's difficult to say whether these trends are indicative of an extended but temporary drought, you know, these large scale cycles, drought cycles, or if this is a kind of a funda more fundamental shift in regime behavior that, that pretends future conditions as affected by climate change. Uh, but the trends are there and they, they are uh, statistically real. If we move over to the, uh, the Navajo River up at Bandit Peak, the same time period, same suite of metrics investigated, we see a, a smaller set of metrics that indicate statistically significant trends uh, we do generally see similar behaviors where we see a decline in peak flow, a different measure of peak flow here. We're looking at May maximum. Uh, and then these declines in, in measures of fall flows, all of these smaller in magnitude than on the San Juan. So to understand what might be controlling these behaviors, uh, we apply our understanding of the first principles of watershed hydrology. Um, to the data, specifically, we think about the, the critical importance of snowmelt runoff on overland uh, runoff generation and on deeper groundwater recharge that ends up making its way to the stream. And we also think about uh, the relationships between precipitation, um, water use by vegetation, and soil moisture. And if we zoom in on the latter, we can begin to explore uh, some of the relationships uh, between precipitation. Um, air temperature, 
the ratio between evapotranspiration, which is just the amount of water being used by vegetation or evaporating off the soil surface, and infiltration, uh, which is the amount of water moving through the soil column and um, into groundwater and, and, uh, and potentially out into streams uh, later. So if we, if we think about those, um, those relationships and how uh, changes in temperature, increasing temperature in this case, or changes in precipitation, decreasing precipitation in this case, might affect that ratio, that balance between evapotranspiration and infiltration, we see we're going to move toward a favoring of evapotranspiration uh, as we move to a warmer, drier climate. So very intuitive stuff. It gets warmer and drier. You'd expect drier soils, more evaporation out of the vegetation. Um, and we can then begin to poke around in the climate data, the available climate data, to see if we um, observe significant trends that kind of confirm, might, might help us understand why we're seeing these uh, changes in stream flow behavior. So here we have uh, data collected at three snowtail stations, two up on Wolf Creek Pass and one uh, down uh, uh, near, uh, near Banded Peak, we'll say. Uh, these are at different elevations, 8,500 feet, 10,200 and 11,000 feet. Um, so they do span the elevation ranges that we see uh, across the, the planning geography pretty well. And if we look for trends in the data set spanning that same period, 1990 to 2020, we see significant upward trends in all of the, uh, all of the data at all three sites uh, across this period. Um, probably not surprising to you all. Well, may, it might be surprising to you all, but uh, <laughs> uh, not totally unexpected. If we uh, look at the, the precipitation data from these same stations, the, the signal is um, more noisy, much more noisy. Uh, we don't see significant trend, trends in most, most months. We do see a downward significant trend in April, July, and September, the strongest trend being noted in September, potentially an indication of a weakening monsoon, um, hard to say. So as per that simple model of watershed hydrology that we presented earlier, we would expect that increasing monthly temperatures across the year uh, will impact snowmelt behavior and um, timing of snowmelt in, in particular, and potentially would lead to changes in late season soil moisture. So we conducted an analysis of hist historical satellite imagery uh, all across the planning area, and this assessment does indicate statistically significant trends toward earlier meltout across the valley floors and in some mid-elevation locations. And that's what you're looking at here, the, the warmer, darker colors indicating stronger, stronger trends in that, negative uh, in that negative direction, meaning earlier meltout. Um, this is uh, data only collected between 2000 and 2020. So there's some caveats here. It can be difficult to detect meaningful trends over uh, periods that are shorter than say 30 years, 20 years is kind of at the, you know, we're really kind of pushing it um, uh, here. And we certainly wouldn't want to go shorter. So as more data uh, of this type is collected uh, in years to come, we'll, we'll have opportunity to explore these uh, trends in greater depth and with um, kind of greater authority. Okay, um, that pattern of statistically significant trends uh, toward earlier meltout um, aligns with some significant trends that we see in soil moisture uh, from the two high elevation snowtail data stations, indicating a general drying out of the soil column. Um, so this drying out of the, the soil uh, column can have impacts on groundwater rechar recharge as well as uh, overland runoff, and can also importantly impact the health and vigor of forests regionally. So here's here we get to the nexus between water and forest health. And um, Aaron, I hope this uh, hits hits it on the head because I I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to spin this story together. Um, so here we are, we've arrived. Um, so the, the first uh, step toward uh, exploring the forest health side a little bit further uh, was an, uh, another analysis of historical satellite imagery 
collected between 2000 and uh, 2001 and 2020. This imagery characterizes a, um, it's an index of uh, canopy wetness. So how, how wet is the vegetation? Uh, and what we see uh, through this analysis is uh, again, uh, a shift, all these dark red areas on the graphic here indicating shifts in canopy wetness toward drier conditions. So dry, a drying out, a significant trend toward, uh, statistically significant trend toward a drying out of the, of the forest across very large swaths of the, the planting area. That's the trend is particularly evident uh, in the high and mid elevation locations. And then we have a couple of interesting things going on here. We've got these really uh, stark, um, stark red areas. These are just, these are the burn, uh, the burn scars from the, the West Fork complex fire. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of erroneous data. Um, and then there's some other considerations here. We do know there have been widespread impacts from beetles. Uh, beetles end up killing large numbers of trees. Those trees are no longer going to be green. You're not going to have wet canopies. So it might be hard, you know, it, it can be hard to tease out the, uh, the, the effect of solely a, the drying out of the soil column from the effect of beetles and the kind of interactions between the two of those. Okay, so I presented to you a, a, a bunch of data, a bunch of information about climate characteristics. I'd like to bring it back to some of the relationships between um, some of those climate characteristics and uh, measures of stream flow behavior or climate characteristics and this index of canopy wetness, uh, which can be an indicator for kind of drought sensitivity. So if we, if we look, uh, Justin indicated that they do some of their planning um, uh, around the, the April 1st snow water equivalent measure. That's a, a, a regularly used metric for characterizing snow packs across Colorado. And if we do some uh, investigation of the relationship between snow water equivalency and total annual water yield, we see that we can explain 72% of the variance uh, in uh, total water annual yield with that snow water equivalency number. So a strong relationship between those two things. Um, drop down a, a level here. Um, if we look for relationships between melt time, air temperature, and that measure of canopy wetness that we, ended, that we just spoke about, uh, we see that there is, um, uh, we, we can explain about 44% of the variance um, in that canopy wetness measure with those two predictor variables. And if we think in terms of flows in the river, our mid elevation melt time uh, is able to explain 41% of the variance in the August minimum flows. So uh, just some numerical kind of uh, ground truthing to reinforce our notions about these relationships between climate, hydrology, forest health and behavior of stream flow uh, in the, the locations that we're concerned about. So what do we do from here? Can we, can we finally get to the part where we're talking about the, the parts of this uh, planning effort that, that have a nexus to management actions? Um, Mandy indicated that, that uh, the specific kind of zone of forest health that we were gonna be diving in on was related to fire. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we note, uh, that we noted was drying forest may pretend increased uh, fire activity. And so we pulled some, some data down from the Colorado State Forest Service, uh, specifically some model estimated wildfire characteristics from across the planning area that are based on vegetation type, fuel loads, uh, historical fire behavior in this area, and uh, existing uh, and future climate characteristics. We used a specific extreme weather fire type uh, to understand, that, to then do some modeling to understand the potential for post-fire sediment delivery um, to streams and rivers across the planning area. So we implemented this model, it's called WEP. We, we used a, a two-dimensional implementation of WEP. You don't care about that, but what it allows us to do is to essentially map uh, existing sediment yields um, across our three watersheds. Um, they're characterized here just as uh, this color ramp moving from white to darker red, darker red indicating higher delivery of sediment off of a hill slope, uh, which may 
make its way down to, well, will likely make its way down to streams and rivers down gradient. Um, this, this, in, this figure that we're looking at here is just the, uh, the representation of uh, existing sediment yields across the planting er area without fire. Um, notably, we see, uh, for some reason, uh, the Navajo seems to be delivering a lot more sediment uh, to local waterways. And if we, if we look at the uh, aerial imagery and if, we, if you ever take a, a drive up to the Oso diversion, um, I think you, it won't be hard to convince yourself that there's a lot of sediment moving through that system, uh, likely just due to the erosive geology up there, the steep gradients on these hill slopes and, and some, of the, some of the combinations between steep gradients, uh, erosive geology, and lack of vegetation. Okay, so if we then use the same model and we basically drop fire on the landscape as predicted by uh, this fire layer that I mentioned previously, we can look at the, the relative change in sediment delivery as a function of fire and um, produce some of these uh, additional mapping products, you know, a really similar representation of soil or sediment yield uh, here, according to the color ramp, you get a sense of where fire seems more or less likely to increase rates of sediment delivery. Uh, and what we see here is the, the upper Blanco seems um, kind of more likely to deliver an, um, uh, an increased load of sediment to uh, downstream waterways uh, than the Navajo does. And this is a function of where that extreme fire is, is actually expected to happen on the landscape, more of that occurring in the Blanco than the Navajo. <clears throat> so this assessment will yield a mapping and characterization of hazards of fire and sediment delivery to water infrastructure and high value environmental and recreational stream resources and downstream reaches. And hopefully, well, it will provide mapping layers um, of these sediment delivery risks that might then be useful for identifying preferred locations for doing forest treatments, maybe, maybe thinning activities. Um, this effort will also produce a map and some discussion of the existing or potential natural buffers um, upstream of, in, of, of important infrastructure or high, high value stream resources that can reduce the risks associated with post-fire sediment delivery. These features include things like well-connected and vegetated floodplains, uh, low gradient wide valley segments, beaver complexes and the like. Okay. That was a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, and I want to be um, mindful of that. But I, I did want to kind of provide a, a little bit of a break here because uh, there's more to come. But if you've got a question, please feel free. Ed, do you want to? You have one in the chat. Do you want to convey that to Seth? I'm sure. Um... I'm not sure if it was true on the San Juan, but on the Colorado River Basin in general, the 80s and the 90s were a pretty lush hydrological period. And that's what you used as the baseline for your comparison. So is there a chance that that distorted how much decline there has been because you picked a fairly lush period to start? Is it not possible to go back to the drier periods in the 50s, the 70s? The, the early melt-off certainly may have of, uh, be a legitimate statistic because it has been getting warmer recently, but I was wondering if some of the other comparisons might have been uh, skewed by the start date of your, of your study. Yeah, that's, you know, some of these trend analyses can be sensitive to the time period that you use and um, you know, that we're not immune from that here. Um, we are, we are um, constrained in a couple ways. All of the satellite imagery that we analyzed um, is uh, we, we don't actually have data that goes back further. That we used all the data that there is. Um, we, we did not have the kinds of satellites orbiting uh, prior to the late 90s, or early 2000s to provide the kind of information that we we're analyzing on um, the, that uh, wetness index, for example. Um, if we were looking just at the metrics of stream flow behavior and the, the trends that we're seeing in stream flow behavior, um, the, you certainly, um, we certainly could analyze trends over different time periods. Um, 30 years is kind of a typical um, historical period to use when characterizing recent trends. 
Um, and I guess the question becomes, you, you end up in this kind of philosophical question where you're, where you're trying to um, uh, sort out whether or not the trends that you're interested in are, you know, are, are, are we interested in recent trends because we think that's where we're going? Are we interested in understanding recent trends within the context of paleo hydrology that we can estimate going back to 1100? Um, you know, would it give us some comfort to know that, yeah, things sure seem to be getting drier quickly, but, you know, on the thousand year time scale, this is nothing. Um, those, those questions certainly stand and um, uh, there's plenty of room for um, additional noodling on that stuff. But I guess I'll, I'll answer your question uh, simply and say, yes, the analysis results are likely impacted by the period over which we look. Almost certainly. Well, in, in general, it would be better if you did allow that there were two lush periods in the uh, aughts and 20s and the 80s and 90s. It's a long running problem on the Colorado River. They started in 1906, and that was one of the wettest years in history. And they disregarded the, the Eric Kuhn and others have talked about this. They disregarded the hydrology in the 1880s and 1890s were very dry too. So it yep. would at least on the gauge records be helpful to maybe look at maybe the, a drier period just to adjust a little bit those stream flow changes. Otherwise, I think the, the work you're doing looks really interesting. And as soon as you have a written report, I'd really like to look at it so I can understand it better. And uh, I might even want to look at some of your GIS data because we need to be doing these similar kind of studies in all of our rivers. So I, I really appreciate the work you guys are doing. All right, well, thanks for that. Excellent question. So the not not so much a question, but just echoing that. I think you know you you asked it for. This is exactly. I think we just need to start figuring out how we're going to compile this. I think you did a great job. I I wouldn't call the West Fork fire an anomaly. I think it's also interesting to start thinking about those transitions that are induced by wildfire and what that means with the association with water. So it's it's really uh, it's really great to see this coming together. Thank you. Excellent point. Okay, I'm going to carry on because we got more to do. Okay, um, so the, the previous question uh, regarding hydrology, and how we think about historical hydrology, teases up really nicely for thinking about future hydrology. Uh, so that was the, the next uh, task at hand was to uh, come back to the stream. So we've, we've exited the forest health realm. Now we're thinking we're taking a more stream centric view. We want to understand. Um, we, we've characterized where we've been. We want to have some understanding of where we might be going, uh, and you can use recent trends to kind of extrapolate where we might be going. So we can use recent trends for, uh, you know, decreasing late season flows and shifts toward earlier runoff, and kind of you know expect that maybe we're going to keep moving in that same direction, or we can use uh, some different different approaches. Um, we used a, a modeling approach here. We did some refinement of the Colorado Water Conservation Board's surface water hydrology and water rights simulation models for, for uh, the Southwest Basin. Uh, and this is an approach that we've used in several other basins to characterize the, the frequency, magnitude, and duration of different stream flow behaviors under existing conditions, under you know, two things, existing conditions where we don't have gauges, that's important, or under many, many conditions um, where, uh, well, under many conditions under population growth and climate future projections. So these, these models use regional estimates for population growth uh, and municipal water demand, and then downscale global circulation model results to estimate changes in inflow hydrology uh, changes in agricultural use demand driven primarily by evapotranspiration and changes in municipal demand uh, driven by, in part, uh, outdoor water use, changes in evapotranspiration and an increasing number of people within a system. Um, the, the models or the, the scenarios that the state uh, kind of selected and holds, holds up as the basis for water planning in Colorado uh, are indicated here in this in this graphic, the state has a lot of great resources describing how these scenarios were, were put together and, and what they mean. But essentially, they, they range from a, we're kind of steady as she goes, scenario A, business as usual, not really much population growth, 
no change in hydrology. Future hydrology looks just like historical hydrology on down to scenario E, where we're looking at a lot of growth, a lot of additional municipal demand um, on uh, water supplies and um, a, a more severe climate future where we have a lot of warming and some drying out. Um, so we're, we're gonna present variously uh, results from, uh, from these different scenarios. Uh, we, we use these data, we use these, these model data sets, did some disaggregation of them to take them from a monthly time step down to a daily time step, uh, and then summarize them between scenarios. We want to know what does average hydrology look like under scenario A, business as usual, future looks kind of like the past. What does it look like under scenario C, where we've got some warming, maybe a little more precipitation and some modest population growth? or scenario E, where we've got significant population growth and um, quite a bit of warming and some drying out of the climate. And we wanna compare those things. We wanna uh, do that statistically, we do it with various kinds of data summaries, but this representation here, I think has more information than, than all of those other uh, ways of characterizing the data. And this just plots out the mean hydrograph, so the kind of typical, behavior, stream flow behavior on the San Juan at Pagosa as characterized by these three different scenarios. Scenario A is this blue and purple, C is the green, and E is the orange line. And those lines are the median flow. And then the similarly colored shaded areas behind it uh, bracket the min and the max daily flow uh, corresponding to those. So it gives you a sense of um, the kind of typical behavior and the range of potential behaviors associated with those planning scenarios. Between the three, what we see is this characteristic shift. Are you ready for it? Toward earlier melt, earlier runoff, and a decrease in yield over the summer months, and then a, a decrease in stream flow in the late fall months. And lo and behold, that sure looks a lot like the, the trends that we're seeing over recent, uh, over recent history in the, the hydrological data uh, itself. If we look at the Rio Blanco, model conditions in the Rio Blanco above the Blanco diversion, similar uh, shift toward earlier runoff here, not as much change in the summer yield, uh, but a similar shift downward in the late summer stream flow. And the Navajo at Banded Peak, um, again, uh, similar to the Blanco, not so much shift in the overall summer yield or even in the peak flows in the summer months, but uh, a shift toward earlier melt and um, a decrease in flow in these late summer months. So these changes in flow have implications for various environmental and or recreational uses um, of our local streams and rivers. Uh, and there are, there are different lenses that we can use to explore those relationships between flow and um, you know, uh, something like aquatic habitat availability and quality. Um, this, the, what we're gonna present on here, the next couple slides is uh, thinking about the relationship between uh, flow and conditions suitable for uh, trout in the San Juan uh, as characterized by the in-stream flow. That's a specific water right that has a biological basis um, you do some, some modeling out in the field to determine how low can the water get before things get uh, difficult for fish to move through the river and identify or and occupy suitable habitat. So the, the in-stream flow is, is a kind of a typical, it's a standard way of thinking about um, low flow conditions necessary for fishery health. And if we use that threshold, that kind of benchmark for aquatic habitat quality and compare it to the flows that we predict for the San Juan at Pagosa, under these different scenarios, we get the graphic that we're showing you below. So we've got different columns here, A, B, C, D, and E, corresponding to the different scenarios, planning scenarios, again, going from A, basically the world we live in now, no change, toward E, hotter, drier, more people, more demands on, on the river. And um, the colors indicate um, how the flows in that particular month, so these panels are months, um, line out on a daily, on a per day basis. 
So for example, in July, we're seeing that 29, there's, there's some math rounding errors that, that happen with these plots, but 29 of the days in July um, end up as optimal flow. And um, that, that's in scenarios A and B. As you move into scenario C, you're down to 22 days are kind of optimal conditions for, for fish. Uh, four days are suboptimal and three are, are unacceptable. And um, you can see how those conditions change then across months. We can plot that data out, kind of shrink those panels a bit and plot it out across the watershed. So we're looking at the San Juan here. Uh, this is down in Pagosa. We're kind of stepping up the San Juan um, to the, the East Fork and the West Fork. And you can get a sense visually of how change um, propagates across space and then across time within a panel, as well as between our scenarios. Um, takeaways here, we see there's a, um, an increase in the number of marginal habitat days in the late summer and in the fall, moving into the fall spawning season. And that characteristic is wide, widespread, but it's particularly pronounced in the East Fork and in the, and in the reaches of the San Juan immediately above uh, Pagosa right here. Um, so we, you know, we hope that this kind of information is going to be useful in the phase three discussions uh, in thinking about um, the strategies that we might use uh, for fishery management uh, to ensure that conditions are favorable to aquatic biota, um, identify locations that might benefit from some, uh, for example, temporary and compensated uh, water leasing or strategic management of a future reservoir, um, et cetera. Um, we've also got some, some other two-dimensional hydraulic uh, habitat modeling results that I'm not going to discuss tonight, but provide some more kind of nuanced characterizations of habitat availability and how uh, that shifts through time um, as it's applied to different life stages um, for you know, a species of trout, brown trout or rainbow trout. Okay, we are pivoting now to the R in ENR use needs, environmental and recreational use needs. Uh, recreational uses in San Juan, we know they're an important contrib contributor to the local economy, uh, also to the quality of life of local residents. I know growing up, I sure loved going and playing on the river downtown. Um, and characterizing the, the relationships between user preferences for stream flows uh, for a given activity, rafting, uh, tubing, supping, fishing, um, and the conditions that present themselves, the stream flow conditions that present themselves in a given year is a typical component of these ENR needs assessments. And we wanted to do something similar here. So we worked with local users to identify flows, um, uh, you know, kind of bin flows as either being optimal, suboptimal, or undesirable for a range of activities that include, again, rafting, kayaking, tubing, fishing, supping. And you can see one of those uh, example survey questions here and the results that came back <clears throat> characterizing the proportion of respondents that ranked a given range of flows indicated here as, in this case, too low for use. So this is... Um, these are responses for uh, rafting in San Juan through town. We see that 100% of people think that uh, flows below 200 CFS or 150 CFS and below are too low for use. Uh, so we use this information to develop thresholds <clears throat> that kind of allow us to bin up days uh, across a year as being too low for use. They're not great, but we'll, I'll use it, I'll take it. Conditions are great, they're optimal, or you know, they're getting a little high. And we can plot that data out in the same way that we did the aquatic habitat uh, assessment data. We've got um, rafting characterization plotted out here above, and then wade fishing uh, down here below. And you can use these uh, visual interpretations to uh, uh, motivate conversations about where we see risk for changes in uh, use opportunity across space and between uses, um, either you know by focusing in on a specific use, by plotting that information out uh, across <clears throat> space. So here we're again just showing rafting uh, use opportunities between April and May, 
uh, we're seeing this kind of characteristic shift where we've got more opportunity moving into the um, April and May timeframe and a decrease in the number of days as you move into more severe climate futures, uh, particularly in July. And um, we can also, there we go, think about the potential for redistribution of preferred flow conditions across months between user groups for these different climate futures. So if we're thinking about climate future C, so the kind of in-between moderately warm climate um, or the more severe condition E, uh, we can indicate whether or not um, for a given activity, in this case, let's look at supping, uh, in April, we see an increase in the number of favorable days for supping to the tune of five days. So we can use uh, tabular summaries and graphical representations of, of the data in this way to kind of support conclusions about how, how things might change in the future and then motivate a conversation, creative conversation about um, how, how we might think about uh, the number and types of access points along the San, uh, San Juan main stem that are going to take advantage of uh, this kind of shit redistribution, potential redistribution of uh, days between user groups and ensure that um, we're not kind of losing out on opportunities for um, kind of the economic activity that goes along with, uh, with use of the river. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. I think I am out of time. Um, I'll just note here quickly that we also did a, an assessment of riparian conservation and restoration opportunities. We looked along the San Miguel, San Miguel, the San Juan uh, uh, main stem above town, identified uh, locations that are sensitive but in good shape and uh, kind of qualified those as potential zones for uh, preservation via some mechanism. Um, and then we identified areas that are uh, degraded, uh, but appear likely to respond positively to uh, revegetation efforts. They have suitable hydrology, uh, indicated those as kind of potential restoration opportunities. So we've got some mapping um, of those two different classes of um, land use or of um, um, land management. And then we identified um, locations on small tributary streams that might be amenable to uh, some uh, process-based restoration work. So streams that are incised that have that appear to have disconnected or lowered water tables that might benefit um, from some uh, work to elevate the channel bed, re-wet out the alluvial aquifer, uh, which can have very positive impacts both for the immediate riparian area as well as uh, any adjacent pasture land uh, that can be sub-irrigated by that um, right, rising water table. Those opportunities seem uh, particularly pre prevalent on McCabe Creek and Mill Creek on private property. And um, so, you know, there, there's some opportunity there, but probably some need for some very careful um, exploration of this idea with uh, any local landowners. Okay, and I'm gonna, Kind of shift things over to Cynthia here. Uh, we also continue to review the outputs provided by this ag infrastructure assessment that Cynthia is going to discuss. And we're, we're looking specifically for opportunities, um, looking specifically to those results for opportunities to enhance aquatic organism passage, um, to think about how we might reduce risk to infrastructure from fire induced debris flow or excessive sediment transport, and then think about uh, potential stream flow costs and benefits. Uh, in terms of kind of water uh, saved at a headgate or uh, the cost of um, uh, a reduced return flow associated with uh, implementation of water efficiency uh, upgrades, ditch lining or piping, for example. Okay, uh, and then I'll just close here by saying that phase three, you know, hopefully we're, we're gonna be leveraging the, uh, all of the data that we're producing from this side, as well as from the, the, con the ag infrastructure uh, assessment side and identify uh, multifaceted, or excuse me, multi-benefit projects that can respond to the, the multifaceted resource management priorities uh, of this local community. Uh, Mandy, I'll, I'll let you decide whether or not we've got any time for questions. 
I vote if folks have questions, um, please include them in the chat and we'll make sure that uh, any of our presenters um, address them here at the end. But I wanna make sure that Cynthia has been waiting patiently has some time. So thank you again, that was so thorough. And everybody buckle up. I know we're throwing a lot of information at you, but it's really, really exciting and important. Um, Cynthia, feel free to share your screen whenever you are ready. Okay, sorry, I'm working on two devices. So um, can everybody hear me? Yep, we can see your screen. Okay, fantastic. Um, so again, my name is Cynthia Purcell and I manage the San Juan Conservation District. And we were tasked with conducting the agriculture irrigation inventory within the upper San Juan River project area. So we put together a team of four retired natural resource professionals, and they were the ones that actually conducted the field surveys for us. And we worked with the agricultural water users, the appropriate ditch representatives and water right holders to inventory the current conditions of the irrigation systems and agricultural water use within this area. I'd also like to note that Jerry Archuleta with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, we share the same office, He's provided um, valuable technical assistance and support with this project as well. So I wanna show you, this is a map or overview of the 14 ditches and laterals that were inventoried. So our team went out with GPSs and they geo-referenced the location of each of these ditches and all the structures or points of interest along each of those ditches. And you can see little points along each of those lines. So each of these structures or points was marked, the existing structure and condition was noted, and photos were taken at each of these points. And then this data was then used to develop cost estimates to address the deficiencies on each of these ditches. So these larger colored polygons, these kind of pink blobs and different colors, um, these are actually the on-farm irrigated fields that receive their water from one of these inventory ditches. And these irrigation systems were also evaluated and cost estimates were developed for these as well. But I'll get into that a little bit later. So this is just a quick summary of all the miles of ditch that were inventoried. And so you can see there was a total of 71.4 miles of ditch that was walked by this crew. And they also inventoried 508 structures or points along each of those ditches. And you can see the breakout there of how many points were um, marked for each of those ditches. So I'm gonna take you into a little bit of the nitty gritty. So this is a sample of the information that was collected. And because we haven't been able to share this inventory information with the respective ditch representatives or ag water users yet, um, due to COVID, unfortunately, I've kind of scrubbed the identifying markers of this sample, but this will give you a good idea of the type of information that was collected along each of the ditches. So I randomly chose a point on one of the ditches. And for this sample, you can see the name, and I hope you can see this, it's not too small, um, but the name of this point is XX2. And it tells you that the description is a division box. And this was inventoried on June 26th of 2020. Then it also shows you that photos were taken at this point. And you can see the photos are listed here. There's one, two, three, four, five photos were taken at this point. So to associate with this table, these are the five photos that were taken at that inventory point. And you can see these are taken from different vantage points. So you can see all the different sides of this division box. And these were real important because these helped us develop the cost estimates to see what needed to be replaced. 
and it records the condition of that structure. So then moving along from that, there is a spreadsheet for each of the ditches that gives more detailed information about each of those points that are recorded. So there is a spreadsheet that was developed for each ditch and that would list all of the points or structures that were noted for that ditch. Again, for our sample, I'm only showing you one. So again, here is the point name XX2. Yes, there were photos taken. The existing structure is a division box. And then these are the dimensions of the existing division box. And then we gave it a condition rating in this column. And we rated everything either one of four ways. It was either poor and needed to re be replaced immediately. It was fair, which means functioning with major defects. It was in good condition, functioning with some minor defects, or it was in excellent condition, functioning properly with no defects. So for the purposes of developing cost estimates, we only developed cost estimates for those that either ranked poor that needed to be replaced immediately or fair functioning with major defects. And this sample point was rated as fair. So then it, there's a notes about what the existing infrastructure is, a steel box with wood slide gates on main channel, flashboards for a wasteway, bank thin directly downstream of the box. So then we move on into this column, the improvement practice. So this is the remedy for that, a new division box. And then there's the quantity, it needs one. And the estimate for that is $23,870. And then we move on to the practice notes. And this tells you the exact dimensions uh, that new box should be constructed to. And then at the end, it says, see sketch, and it will take 5,031 pounds of steel. So if we continue on, because the spreadsheet's got a lot of columns, so we continue on with this spreadsheet and you'll see there's improvement practice two. So this was an alternative that was developed. If they did not want to make a division box out of steel, they could choose to do a division box for $22,728 for a concrete box, same dimensions as the steel box, and then it gives the cubic yardage of concrete that you would need to construct it out of concrete. And that brings us to the column for the total cost. Now the total cost depicted in this um, scenario is the most expensive alternative that is prescribed for the condition. So there could be um, on some of the items, there may be three alternatives for remedying that in existing infrastructure. For this, this example that I chose, there were two alternatives, but I chose the higher um, cost to help with estimating um, total cost in the end. And then it goes on to tell you comments that this is working in spite of its age and condition of the metal and the wood, but could be replaced. So this was formulated for all the, all the points and all the structures along each of the ditches. And you'll know that um, the division box made out of steel, it said to see the sketch. So anything that needed a design sketch, a design sketch was developed. And then again, you would refer back to that spreadsheet to get the actual dimensions of each of these pieces of the design. So this kind of summarizes the estimated cost it would take to make all of the improvements that were rated either poor or fair for each of the ditches. And this is kind of ranked um, in descending order. You can see the snowball ditch um, needed the most or cost the most to make the improvements necessary for that and then trending downward. So the total estimate to repair these, this is just the proper ditches was a little $5.47 million to make those improvements. So now I'm gonna take you back to that original map that I showed you at the beginning. So we also contacted each property owner that irrigates with water received from these inventory ditches. And they were offered a free evaluation of their current irrigation system 
with suggestions for improvements. And then we also provided cost estimates to go along with those. So their current irrigation method was mapped on here as well. So if you look at the legend over here on the left, you'll see it was broken out into one of three irrigation types. There, the ditch irrigation is pink. So you can see there are a lot of pink polygons on here. These are all fields that are irrigated via ditch. The second being gated pipe, which is green. And you'll see fewer green fields, but there are some green fields out there. And the last being a sprinkler, and which is orange. And at this scale of the map, you do not see any orange um, polygons because there are very few. So there were approximately 160 irrigators um, and they are irrigating about 322 fields. It comes to a total of 5,374 total acres that are being irrigated within this project area. And then we look at the irrigation method. So the first being ditch and 4,664 acres are um, irrigated via ditch. And that has a percent efficiency rating of about 30 to 50%. And then when we bump up to gated pipe, you can see there's only 683 acres are actually irrigated with gated pipe at this point. And that has an efficiency rating about 50 to 60%. If you bump up to a sprinkler system, there is only 27 acres that are actually irrigated with a sprinkler. And that bumps your efficiency rating up to 70 to 75%. So we cost estimates were developed to improve each of these irrigated fields to its highest potential efficiency. So in most cases, this was moving from those pink blobs um, to the green blobs. So that's moving from ditch irrigation to gated pipe. There's only a few instances that we recommended um, moving to a sprinkler system. And that's mostly due to the terrain of our landscape. It's just not conducive to large sprinkler systems. So again, going from top to bottom, the on-farm irrigation improvements that uh, cost estimates that were developed, again, starting with the most expensive down to the least expensive for a total estimate of $3.33 million for the on-farm improvements. So when we look at the grand total in the scheme of things, um, 5.47 to do the ditch improvements, and 3.33 to do the on-farm improvements, we're looking at a grand total of about $8.8 .8 million to make all of these improvements. So our next steps, um, we're going to continue doing our inventory process. We're gonna move into the Blanco Basin. And then as time allows, we're hoping to get into the Navajo River Basin as well as part of phase three. And um, one of our biggest priorities is being able to present these results to each of the ditch leads or representatives and the ag water users so we can get their feedback on what their priorities are versus what our inventory found. Um, and then we can gauge their interest in moving forward to hopefully installing these improvement practices and seeing what kind of funding they may need to from grants or other sources to help them accomplish their goals. And lastly, is to go out and to seek the funding to make all of this happen. So some alternatives to consider, um, we've thought about tailoring some of those improvement projects requests to the different types of grant opportunities that may be available. One method may be with the whole ditch. Maybe we take park ditch, for example, and we just focus on one ditch and we go after grants to improve maybe just the ditch or maybe the ditch with the on-farm improvements as well. So that could be either or, or maybe we focus on the highest priorities within each of these ditch systems um, so we can kind of spread the love or possibly replacing the head gates at the diversion points of each of these ditch. And that would allow, um, that would hopefully improve fish passage or allow for 
other projects that would um, allow for environmental and recreational things such as Seth was talking about. So we're really looking forward to continuing with our inventory process. And we really just want to get the results into the hands of the water users so they can start making some decisions about moving forward with implementation. And that does it for me. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, folks, I recognize we're a little bit over time. Uh, I think we'll, we'll hang on for a bit for those who want, but I understand if you do need to jump off. Um, I would like to open it back up to the audience if you know we just uh, shared a lot of information, what kinds of questions are coming to your mind. And, and while you're thinking of those questions, I'm gonna put up a poll just to kind of check in with you all. Um, you know, do these results that Seth and Cynthia were sharing, are they ref accurately reflecting what you're experiencing on the ground and what you expect to see in the future? And, and feel free to unmute yourself and chime in um, with any questions you may have. Uh, question, I, uh, this is Bill Hudson. I have a question for Cynthia. Go ahead, Bill. Um, so um, I, I understand that the, the change in the uh, type of irrigation system um, might affect the efficiency of, of the agricultural users' uh, um, use of water. Are we, are we also looking at water being wasted by the diversion structures that, that I think you, you were um, listing that at $5 million to replace those, uh, those diversion structures? Um, are, are, we, are we having a, a, a loss of efficiency through those structures or is it, is it aesthetic or what, what is the reason for um, wanting to replace those, those diversion structures? That is for water efficiency. And that, that total cost, that does not only include the diversion sites, that includes all of the structures along that ditch that could need replacing, repaired. Um, there were areas that should or probably could be piped to help with that um, loss of water. And um, in that regard, uh, when the water gets lost in, a, in an agricultural area, it sometimes flows uh, to, another, to another user. Um, are, you, are you tracking that? If my diversion structure is leaking, maybe my neighbor is benefiting from that? Uh, is that something that you're also tracking? Uh, yes. Um... We're tracking where the water goes, who is using it. Um, we, at this point, we are not tracking the water rights as to who has the right to use that. We are just tracking where the water flows and how to keep it where it's supposed to go. Thanks, Cynthia. There's a, another question from Bill and Lisa asking about the um, cost of ditch repair, is that going to be paid by ditch users or owners, the ag producers, are there grants or support from Samuel Conservation District, NRCS, or the county? So yes, there will be a, a combination of all of that, we're hopeful. Um, again, depending on where, which ditch you live on and what your representation is, um, that'll be, again, that's a collective conversation that needs to be had with the water users to see what they are comfortable with handling on their own, what they need help with financial, financially. Um, so then we can go out and search for money. There is opportunity for um, cost share through the NRCS for projects on private land that we can um, look at there. And then hopefully we can find other sources of funding to help fill those gaps. And we can use leverage one um, with the other so that um, the match could probably be 
uh, count towards towards both. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, while other folks are thinking of questions, I'm gonna share initial results from those of you who participated in the poll. You can see from 50%, folks very much agree with what the results are shown that that's what they're seeing or experiencing or expect. 44% somewhat agree and some one person or 6% was unsure. So, so far we don't have any glaring things that we got something off that is looking wrong. And so that's, that's great feedback for us to know. Um, I wanna pause and see if anyone else has questions before I give a brief wrap up this meeting. Yeah, Mandy, I have one more question for Seth. Um, okay. He had uh, he, he had made a statement. Seth, you made a statement that uh, that it looked like we were seven hundred acre feet of water lower uh, over the past twenty years, I think, or maybe thirty years um, in in the total system between I think what did you say April and September? Um, there was a seven hundred acre foot discrepancy there. Can we put that into a perspective? What's the total acreage um, between that in that time period? Is 700 a huge number or is it is it a drop in the bucket? Um, that, that number, that's a great question, Bill. That number um, is uh, an annual number. So the, the year over year average decline associated with the trend is 700 acre feet per year. Um, <clears throat> the actual number over the 30 year period, right, is 700 times 30. So it's a much bigger number. Um, but the, yeah, to put that in context, um, that, that certainly can be helpful and it's very hard for all of us, I think, to think, except for maybe Joe, to think in terms of acre feet. Joe and Justin are probably all over it. Um, uh, and, and Joe, maybe you want to jump in and help me here. So 100 acre feet is 10 CFS for uh, 10 days. Once, oh, geez, I'm not going to do that math right in my head. You're roughly there. I think yeah. something in perspective is just, you know, uh, comparative is, you know, some of the volumes of our lakes that we have, you know, think of it as just a sheer volume in a bowl of water that that water is no longer available as it historically had been in the stream. And I think, you know, off the top of my head, I want to say almost um, town center lake that's in town here and Lake Forest are roughly around the 600 to 690 acre foot range. So just that sheer volume of water um, you know, interpreting from what your analysis is saying is there's a loss to the system on runoff from that trend roughly around that 700 acre foot range. So basically town center lake is reduced every year on water. That's a great, that's a great way to think about it. Thank you, Joe. And, and well, maybe, maybe Seth, you can, you can email me a number if you could, if you could work one up, I'm sure you must have it because because you calculated the loss uh, over the over the, the annual yeah. loss. I'm just interested in the annual loss. I'm not I'm not looking at the 30 year loss. The annual is 700 acre feet. So, um, so do, are you asking Bill for that right. number in terms of CFS it, per day or something? Or what? What are you? Um, no, that's the total I'm, I'm looking for. Well, if there's if there's seven million acre feet that run down the river, 700 acre feet may not be a really important number. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at what's the total that that, that, that 700 is short from. Yep. Is it 7 million or is it 700,000 or what, sure. what, what is the total acre feet that, okay. that, that is the total for that year? Sure, yep, I can do that. I just wanna chime in, uh, Great. Jacob recommended or suggested maybe it might be useful to compare 700 acre feet per year to town's consumptive use. So I think, you know, this is exciting. You guys are asking detailed questions and, you know, is the presentations tonight just go to show um, like what kind of information we have available and the people 
to start diving into these questions. Um, and so, you know, this isn't gonna be the only time you're hearing from us. Hopefully you all can see my screen right now, but um, so what, what's left in phase two? And so we're new, we initially um, had hoped to, to kind of check back in sooner, but as everybody dealt with the challenges of COVID, here we are and we've um, wanted to present these results. And so we're hoping to share the final report from these results um, in May and June. And the steering committee is gonna start lining out a tentative schedule for phase three in April and May. And again, that's gonna be really dependent on um, COVID guidelines. And so we're hoping to offer, rather than coming back to you at the, a big public gathering, because we recognize this isn't always the, the best way to collect feedback. And we're all very anxious um, to get together in person, look at maps, mark areas, talk about project specifics, um, as, as I'm sure the rest of you are, but we're just trying to be strategic and safe about that. And so we hope to offer up, um, whether it's for small gatherings, especially for groups or individuals that would like to discuss this further, please um, don't hesitate to contact me or Al Fister. I'm gonna give my information in just a moment. But um, like I said, this isn't the last you're gonna hear from me because we're about to wrap up phase two and enter into phase three this summer. And so Cynthia kind of outlined already what her team's gonna be doing. Mountain Studies Institute, um, Seth and his team, we're gonna continue coordinating with these, the steering committee um, and stakeholder engagement, offering up a variety of options for, for all of you to weigh in. So um, that's still being determined, uh, but at the very least, what we have um, on our radar is that we would like to at the very least host two workshops to really dive into those questions that you're asking right now. And so that may happen in summer or fall. And so that can be with key decision makers or interested parties to come up with an initial kind of project and priorities list and then present that to the broader public to kind of weigh in because we know sometimes it can be hard to start from scratch in these bigger public meetings. So having something to work off of that we edit or um, change or add to can be really helpful. And then that last public meeting to kind of finalize that um, watershed plan or the IWMP stands for Integrated Water Management Plan. And so um, again, I recommend visiting uh, the group's website to learn more details. We're gonna be sharing that report very uh, in the upcoming months. If you have any questions in the meantime, or if you're interested in um, the steering committee or one of us coming to discuss this in more detail, please don't hesitate to reach out so that we can kind of schedule those in the next coming months because whether that's virtually or um, in other ways, whether it's an email or a phone call, happy to accommodate as best as we can. And with that, let's see if there's any more. Um, and I just got another question about growing water smart. So that's that's a good event to keep in mind. Thank you, Bill and Lisa. Uh, any other questions for, for me at this time? I so appreciate all of you hanging in there. I recognize we went over and it was a lovely evening. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you to our amazing steering committee members, Seth and Cynthia. You guys are working so hard. Thank you. Good to see your faces, Bill and Lisa. You guys, great, great. Thank you all. Good job, you guys. Thank you. Yep, great work. Thanks, everyone.